Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that, unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right. Welcome to another edition of Politics Done Right. Today, we have a very special person, Charlotte Dennett. Charlotte Dennett is the Beirut-born daughter of America's first master spy in the Middle East, uh, Daniel Dennett. She is an investigative reporter and the author of The Crash of Flight 3804. Charlotte believes her father would roll in his graves over Trump's uniquely dangerous Middle East policies and likely with the current Middle East policies as well. Uh, without further ado, welcome to Politics Done Right once again, Charlotte. How are you doing this afternoon? Hey, great. Egberto, last time we talked, that was the title. Uh, but the book's come out in paperback. It has a new title, Follow and, the uh, Pipelines. Actually, I know the new title, and I have it right in front of me. Oh, you okay. Changed the, you change the name to Follow the Pipelines, Uncovering. Yeah. The yeah. mystery of a lost spy and the deadly politics of the great game for oil. Correct. Uh, and I think, I think your premise, both with what's going on in, 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 uh, let's say, uh, Gaza, as well as Ukraine. But firstly, let's say Ukraine has an oil component. I think that is the premise of. Uh, of what you're talking about. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Um, it happens that Ukraine has the second largest oil and natural gas reserves in Europe, next to Russia, if you want to consider Russia part of Europe. This is something that doesn't get told. It doesn't get told in any of the wars, whether it's Ukraine, Gaza, Iraq, whatever. Uh, yes, uh, and most of those reserves are located in the eastern part of the country, exactly in the Donetsk region, region exactly where all the fighting is happening right now. In the now. Donbass region. Yeah, and, and also Ukraine is crisscrossed by a huge, huge number of pipelines that were uh, Russian-owned. And um, Are these Russia still functional pi pipelines? I believe that those still are, which is okay. interesting, because as as long as as they are, then presumably Ukraine can still get some royalties out of it. But the fact of the matter is, um, the uh, the situation is such that uh, Russia has limited some of its exports to to Europe. And of course, the sabotage of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline put a real dent in Europe's uh, energy um, resources. And that the, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline was going to carry Russian oil to Germany and then be distributed throughout Europe. And I, I think uh, some of it through that whole uh, old pipeline system. So the, the war in Ukraine has caused a major scramble among uh, European countries to look for alternative sources of energy. So let's back up there. Uh, Europe is going to be looking for or has been looking for more sources because of the war in Ukraine. Yes. But, uh, so which came first, the chicken or the egg? Is the war in Ukraine uh, because of oil? Or uh, g give me the, the what what's your research tells you. Okay, in the, the invasion by Russia in twenty February twenty twenty two uh, happened after uh, the United States had tried to prevent the Nord Stream two 
pipeline from going into effect. In fact, the uh, the Biden administration, even before, they're very concerned about this Nord Stream pipeline system, Nord Stream One and Nord Stream Two. They go they go under the Baltic Sea and uh, they supply Europe with energy. And it was particularly Nord Stream 2 that, that had, uh, well, certainly the Biden administration very concerned. So Why? it's because it was going to supply even more natural gas to Russia, which already uh, relies on. What did I say? To Europe. Russia. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. I've been I've been studying all day, getting caught up. It's incredible. Anyway, so right after the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, the first sanction that was done against Russia was against Nord Stream 2. It hadn't been sabotaged yet. That would happen a year later. It was the first sanction. Uh, uh, the United States put a lot of pressure on Germany to cancel uh, the, um, the basically they canceled the the contract with Russia. It was all set to go. Last now, who summer. built it? Who paid for building that that infrastructure? That cost billions of dollars. Yes, it does. It it was a combination. It, it was Russian, and uh, there there was some European uh, involvement in that in that pipeline too. And uh, I believe Germany, obviously, uh, I can't tell you exactly right now because I I've been so focused on Gaza. I, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll have to, um, you know, check back on who it is. But but uh, it was a big venture and the U.S. wanted it killed and Germany succumbed. And so that's not there. So here, it, for instance, Germany was trying to get uh, to eliminate its reliance on nuclear power. And uh, when this happened, th th there was a desperate search for alternatives. And one of the things that th that's happened is that uh, fracked gas from the United States has suddenly been shipped in in massive quantities. It's LNGs. Right. Uh, Germany's created new LNG ports to, to bring that in. And so it's been a great boon for American uh, gas Natural interests. Gas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but at any rate, they're still desperately searching for alternatives. And lo and behold, who would you think uh, that Europe and the United States would go to? Guess where? I'm scared to say Israel. You got it. Yeah. Now, Israel is not known as a gas or, or an oil producer. So how does that mesh? How does that mesh? Well, in fact, um, around... Uh, 2000, 1999, actually, uh, British Gas uh, was um, contacted and contracted to explore for oil off and natural gas off the coast of Gaza. And the then Palestinian, Palestinian Authority uh, authorized them to do it. And lo and behold, they found a lot, a lot there. So then it became a question of how was it going to be uh, exploited and uh, who was going to benefit from it. Uh, Arafat, as you may remember, the uh, head of the PLO. PLO yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, he was alive at that point and was in charge of the Palestinian Authority. He thought like, oh, this is fantastic. This is a great boon. For Palestine, at last, we're going to be independent. We're going to have our own natural resources, which, by the way, they have the right, even though they are under occupation, they have a right to develop their own natural resources. And uh, so there was hope that, that this was going to solve a lot of uh, Gaza's problems. But um, the Israelis wouldn't allow it. They said under uh, the uh, Sharon, Prime Minister Sharon, uh, he balked at it. And then uh, future Israeli regimes have prevented uh, Gaza from developing that natural gas, which was uh, estimated to bring in at least a billion dollars worth of revenue. So Was that uh, a billion per year or was that the amount of reserves they well, had? Well, <laughs> here's the thing. It was total, that, and they figured, well, that's good. We, we can take a billion dollars worth of revenue. 
But I've just just updated now. I've got new information. And hold on, because it's it's just amazing. Apparently, there's a lot more under under uh, Gaza and the West Bank, and the amount is worth, and this is natural gas and oil, 500, 500 billion dollars. Is that's what it's, that's what it's valued at. So that is the amount of, uh, that is, that is a reserves under the water in Gaza and in the land off of uh, the West Bank. That's correct. What about in Israel? That doesn't include Israel proper. The, no, the, the part. That, then there's Israel proper. It's got another giant field. It's called Leviathan, and that's being developed. And in fact, uh, uh, the United States and Israel uh, signed a memorandum of, of understanding that uh, they would cooperate with each other in developing uh, these fields, these natural gas fields. And uh, I'm saying this because I just got the information. And the uh, it was actually a uh, United Nations report that was done in 2019 that that actually uh, goes into great detail on this. So I've been um, I, I've had to sort of recompute everything, but the whole point is that Gaza is being leveled so they can have. Uh, Security. Security of the pipelines has always been fundamental. This is a result of all my research for years, going way back to 1947 when my father, the America's first master spy in the Middle East, was working on the Trans-Arabian pipeline. And that's how I learned that, um, as he wrote in one of his declassified reports, protection of, of the oil uh, is is what matters at all costs. We must protect the oil at all costs. So take that right up now to the present. Same phenomenon. Um, in two thousand and nine, uh, the Israelis invaded Gaza with the express purpose of keeping the natural gas out of the hands of Hamas. And then it happened again in two thousand fourteen. It was even a bigger. Uh, invasion and uh, that one killed 2,100 Palestinians. Well, now look at look at the numbers. We're at 11,000, 12,000. Approaching 12,000. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is this is just unacceptable. Okay. Now, let me ask you this because you know, uh, just before I came to this interview, I was speaking to a, a, a an oil executive and I looked at him and I said, uh, you know, I'm going to be interviewing Charlotte Dennett about. Uh, oil and that, you know, there is an oil component to the Gaza Gaza war. And he started to laugh and he said, look, if there was oil, if there was any substantive oil or gas there, we would be drilling it right now. And there, there would, we wouldn't have to be talking about any of these issues. So um, I don't know what you're talking about is what the guy said. That, uh, and this was an oil exec. And I said, well, you know, I, I'll find out tonight exactly uh, whether there really is a component to war. He said, do you really think that um, uh, 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 that somehow Netanyahu arranged for 14 or it's now 1,200 for Hamas to come into Israel and, and, and kill 1,200 people? And I said, no, I don't believe that. But again, you have to ask, how did Hamas get 1,200 people? Uh, how did they come into Israel to kill 1,200 people anyway again? So um, I kind of kind of muzzle my executive, my oil executive for me. What should I do? Ah, uh, really? Well, I'm I'm very surprised that he said that. Um, he he's not going to like my analysis. I've been studying oil and genocide most of my adult life. My husband and I wrote a major, major book. I mean, a thousand page book on uh, the development of the Amazon uh, and uh, how uh, oil exploration was uh, responsible largely for the genocide of 100,000 indigenous tribes and, or peoples uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. And the name of that book is Thy Will Be Done, The Conquest of the Amazon, Nelson Rockefeller and Evangelism in the Age of Oil. 
So I'm, I'm telling you, the link is there. When the oil companies want to extract resources, they, what they do is, first of all, they send in missionaries. That's the peaceful way to do it. The miss missionaries are, tr are supposed to pacify the people. And when that doesn't work, nastier things happen, which we documented in this book, which has been called an anatomy of conquest. You can, uh, you can apply the, the, the main uh, principles of how you conquer to most parts of the world, which I then ended up doing uh, with regard to the Middle East. So um, now you look at what the situation is in uh, Gaza. First of all, the idea that the Israeli uh, much vaunted security services did not know that there was uh, going to be an attack has come under scrutiny now, as it should. Well, Haaretz has actually uh, has really did a, did a lot of writing about that. The, the Israeli, uh, one of the major Israeli rags, I think it's called Haaretz, right? Yes, that, Haaretz. Yeah. That's, a, that's sort of the progressive uh, Israeli newspaper, yes. And and they pretty much came and called out Netanyahu as, as indirectly funding Hamas, which would... Uh, uh, I am just surprised that it hasn't had much more traction than it had. Well, the funding of Haaretz, the reason for that, that happened um, in uh, 2005 after uh, Israeli forces withdrew from Gaza. But the whole point is there's actual documentation that uh, the reason that they did that, why why the decision was made to fund our, um, Hamas. Hamas was to divide it, divide right. it, divide it from the Palestinian Authority. And that way they could say that uh, we don't want this terrorist organization to have access to that natural gas that's right off the shores of, of Gaza. So um, that was uh, the reason. And it's been documented that these uh, these two invasions the whole purpose was to wipe out ha Hamas and prevent the Palestinians from getting these gas reserves because the Israelis argued that it would go towards funding terrorists. You see, they keep using this argument. Well, but I mean, I, yeah, they, I, mean I, 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 you know, I just want for the audience listening here because I want to make a categorical statement. As an engineer, I'm a numbers person. If you look at the amount of buildings destroyed, in in uh, Gaza and the amount of buildings destroyed in Israel, the amount of people killed in Gaza and the amount of people killed in Israel in this war in, in this war where both parties have some sort of a, a, a of a culpability, I think uh, it's hard to define Hamas as the sole terrorist in this whole action. I just want to lay that out. Continue, please. Now, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite say that you said Hamas. What? I, I didn't I, quite I, hear. I, 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 I couldn't. I, I could not say that the only terrorist involved here uh, is Hamas, because yeah. if we look at the uh, of dead people and destroyed property, I am sorry, uh, my eyes are not deceiving me. Continue, yeah. please. Well, nobody's eyes are, are deceiving them, but some people don't want don't want to look at what was the obvious. This was an entirely disproportionate attack, uh, and um, it, it was collective punishment. That's something Israel has done many, many times. Um, it, you know, there will be a, uh, Palestinians will, will attack some small area and previously, and then Israel will come back and destroy homes. I mean, that's what it's been doing for for decades. It, and then it's a tragic one, story. And when you, when you complain about it, uh, some would want to use the the, the anti-Semitic theory. Well, yep. What I've said on my program is we will not allow th that deception to continue. We love our Jewish brothers and sisters. We will not allow any Israeli uh, terrorists to actually uh, try to assume that anybody on my program is an anti-Semitic person because that will not be the case. But we do not support the deaths of thousands of innocent people and the destructions of billions in infrastructure that they don't intend to repay to continue. Um, Charlotte, uh, in as much as we speak about uh, the oil component, the petrol component of the war in Gaza that many want to dismiss, 
there's yet more. I've uh, I've read and I don't know. I've, I've I've read a whole lot of conspiracy theories. And I said, since I'm going to have the expert on pipelines with me, that I probably should ask this as well. There is this canal that been thought of now for many, many years, supposedly to rival the Swiss Canal. In other words, no longer would we depend on the Arabs for a sea level canal to connect uh, these two bodies of water. We will now pass it through that friendly country, that little country of Israel. Is there anything to the war and the canal? Absolutely. Because the canal is um, planned to start at the tip of Gaza, on uh, the northern tip of Gaza, and then it, it it's the plan. And I I've heard that they they've already started working on it. Although I'm not sure how they could if it's if they're starting in northern Gaza where all the fighting is going on right now. But it helps sort of kind of explain why they've leveled that whole area. Anyway, yeah, it's to run there and it's to go all the way down, down through Israel to the what's called the Gulf of Aqaba, right. which you've got to look at a map to see it. It's but, a very but, small area where Israel has, uh, has a coastline. Yes, it has a coastline, and so does Jordan. Uh, and then that area connects to the Red Sea, which is very important for, right. for shipping oil. But here's the interesting thing, too. It also is going to connect with Saudi Arabia's futuristic Neom. Uh, this is this new high-tech city that Saudi Arabia is building. And, and so this sort of explains why Israel and Saudi Arabia were, e were going to further the normalization of their relations. So what this is, is it, it's a giant infrastructure project that is backed by the United States and uh, and obviously Saudi Arabia. And so, so some people are saying, gee, it must have been this uh, normalization that got Hamas going. Well, my guess is that uh, they knew that they, they were done. I mean, once you got these huge, powerful corporations, and they're not just oil companies, of course, they're high tech. Um, once they, they get working on this new supposedly uh, wonderful development program that's going to bring peace to the Middle East, they knew that, that it was all over for them. Now, there's another component, the, uh, the Great Game for Oil, which is the subtitle of my book. You can be sure that the Russians and the Chinese are watching this very carefully, too. And some are saying that even Rus the Russians were behind the Hamas attack. I, you know, I don't know if that's true, but the fact is, uh, I think I, I just read today that, uh, the Chinese were, were interested in what, what's going on in Neom. And, uh, there, there may be some high tech uh, deals and cooperation that are going on. So then you're wondering why is China meeting with, I mean, China's Xi is meeting with Biden right now. You can be sure they're talking about all of these events, uh, that are happening, you know, in Gaza and then going down to this canal. The canal thing was the, the canal project was considered, whoa, I don't know, decades ago. Actually, in the 40s, I believe, late 40s, right after the inception of Israel, as I understand it, yeah, it and, was discussed. And then it was shelved. What, what brought it to the fore, supposedly, was the fact that a big tanker got stuck in the Suez Canal. Exactly. I think that was and about a year down, ago. Ship it. Yeah, it and shut it down, shut it down. Right. So, so anyway, so now it, it's, it's back, on the, uh, back on the books. and. Um, that I think that would also explain why Israel wants to flatten Gaza. You know, it's, oh God, this is so you, sickening. You, you know, just... uh, uh, when I when I listen to all these stories, right, and um, you realize, you know, I, I I talk a lot about the corporations and countries, and yeah. I, I I I speak about there's no real countries anymore. It's all a corporate driven world. And, and, and everything about countries are used as pawns for companies to be able to get things done. Here you talk about Saudi Arabia getting into good grace with Israel. Yeah. Uh, and you wonder, we thought there were some religious conflicts there and all of that, but 
the mighty the mighty uh, financial dollar is more important than anything else. So I mean, oh my I, god, yeah. Uh, here's here's an irony for you, Alberto. That um, in 1943, when uh, the the Holocaust, the horrors were becoming known to the United States. Uh, there was a question about whether U.S. Air Force would bomb the killing machines, the gas chambers in Auschwitz. And um, a determination was made by John J. McCloy, who was uh, in, in charge of the uh, armed forces. Um, and he decided, no, that, um, that Auschwitz would not be bombed. And and by the way, the people in Auschwitz wanted it. They thought they were going to die anyway, but they thought it would destroy the killing machines. He said no, uh, because it would d divert the uh, Air Force away from I.G. Farben. Well, it turns out that was a complete lie because I.G. Farben is very close to Auschwitz. It, would, it wouldn't have been a diversion. If the killing machines had been destroyed, then thousands of Jews could have escaped to Palestine. They would have gone down. The, it was no. It, they would have gone down to um, through Turkey to Palestine, and it was known by some of the Jewish survivors because they were the first to carry signs saying "No blood for oil." Little fact that's not well known. But anyway. Um... Charlotte, um, I think what you're doing here by presenting the, the oil component and notice that I said component because a lot of these um, a lot of these actions have, in fact, many, many components of which it, it is almost like kill one uh, kill as many birds with one stone. This one Israeli war is probably going to accomplish quite a bit, both in the oil domain and otherwise. So let's continue with um, what else you have found as far as the tragedy of this war? Well, again, I was saying, um, I think we have to look very carefully at this claim that uh, that Israel was caught by surprise. I already know, and I've researched this, uh, the Egyptian uh, intelligence warned Israel. Egyptian is the Egyptians are are watching this all very closely. Uh, they they are in proximity to right. uh, the eastern Mediterranean there. So they've got people, they've got informers in there, sort of the Israelis. And, and to say that they, they didn't know this was going to happen, you know, it stretches credulity. I really believe that. So then you have to ask yourself, uh, you know, the Israelis wanted to destroy Hamas in two other wars, which were horrific, in 2009 and 2014. So, hey, um, I mean, people are asking this. Didn't Netanyahu let this happen? So he has the pretext to go in once and for all and totally destroy Hamas and the people there. People are starting to ask this, and I think they should be asking it um, because uh, it was horrendous what happened to, to the Israelis. I condemn that. But at the same time, um, it just seems like uh, this fits in very nicely for Netanyahu, who is very unpopular, by the way. Can we forget all those massive demonstrations that just happened uh, several months earlier about the, uh, how Netanyahu was trying to change the judiciary? And, and part of that was to not allow uh, more settlements encroaching on uh, the West Bank, for instance. And there have been more attacks on the West Bank, by the way. So, um, and then there were all these protests. And, I mean, a lot of the Israelis uh, worried about their democracy, but there were other um, Israelis that were also worried about uh, what this fascist, mm -hmm. he's a fascist, all right? And, and that's what's so appalling about this. This fascist is being allowed to commit genocide. That is well, what it is, and it is it is the definition of genocide. When you target an ethnic group and you want to drive them off their land, you want to kill them, you want to prevent them from having their um, 
their medicine, their food, their fuel. This is just appalling what we're watching on t- TV. And it doesn't help the Jews at all. No, I mean, and I, again, I, I, that's why in, information is so important. And I, I think uh, it is time as well to, uh, to show that what Netanyahu is doing is no different than what he's accusing Hamas of doing. I think we have to go into uh, telling this story with open eyes. I just think it's important and I'm glad that you have relayed the story with regards to uh, what the financial aspect, the petro aspect of it is, but also there's a human aspect that has to be uh, t- has to be taken into account as well. Okay, Charlotte, let me ask you: um, Where do we go from here as far as exposing uh, what you found in uh, as as you talk about follow the pipelines? Uh, thank you. I, I just want to say one other thing. I I am greatly heartened that that Jewish Voice for Peace uh, has come out in great numbers and protested. Uh, both uh, they're doing it here in Vermont. They're doing it in Washington D.C. and New York. Oh my God! It's so important that they they dispel the years of of propaganda uh, that that Israel has very successfully used um, to hoodwink people, including the Jewish people. So they are brave. I stand with them. I think people should support them wholeheartedly. And, uh, what can people do to find out more? Well, I can barely keep up with it. Uh, but I do have a, uh, website that's also called follow the pipelines. I would really encourage people, um, to get my book. I, I normally don't, you know, I don't make a lot of money in this because I'm, I'm writing truth to power, quite frankly. When you write about oil, boy, <laughs> it's difficult. But, uh, but I, I now urge people, uh, you can get it at Amazon.com. Uh, I'll have uh, a link to it in, in, in the blog post that corresponds to this show. But yes, sure. it's on Amazon and it's called Follow the Pipelines, Uncovering the Mystery of, of a Last Fi and the Deadly Politics of the Great. A uh, game of oil by Charlotte Dennett. It's an important book to get. Uh, this is the second time that we are going over this book. This is, I think, what your second or third edition of the book, or no? It's the paperback edition. You know, is it the... really suffered when it came out during COVID, and that's yes. when we finally decided, all right, we're going to put it in paperback and give it a different title. Uh, but um, yeah, it's important because it doesn't just cover this; it covers the war in Iraq. At, Afghanistan, I, I, I have 10 pipeline maps, and uh, they all help explain these, these endless wars that I, are going on. I, I trust that your website has the updated because the information just keep coming, and you don't know what, what's going to happen in Gaza in the next two weeks, oh. which you, you may have to update your website for stuff not covered in your book. Yeah. Well, look, <laughs> uh, look, Charlotte, um, a, a author of Follow the Pipelines, it's been my pleasure to speak to you, and I, I, I want folks to be more aware. These are voices that need to be heard. Your, your voice, many voices like yours, are important that we get it out right now and do it without fear. Because right now, what's occurring in our country is too many people are quiet. Too many people are scared to come and speak the truth. Because speaking the truth means you're going to be called a whole lot. Uh, you're going to be misrepresented. But Thank that's, you, Egberto. It's very what, important. But we have to get the truth out. So what my feeling is, we got to look at this whole thing differently. We cannot look anymore as Arabs versus Jews. The Armenians, I document this, they right. were they were victims. The, the Jews, the Arabs, and now all of us because of climate change. Who has brought us but these horrible climate you know what, disasters? You know what is that? You know what is the most scary statement of all of this that where we are still fighting about this polluted, pollu- polluted, polluting uh, substance is still, we're still worrying about it, which it almost tells me that uh, if uh, these corporations have their way, there's no time soon 
that we are going to be getting off of these types of uh, fossil fuels and that right now it's a facade. All the green energy that they talk about, about BP, beyond petroleum, <laughs> all these things are nothing more than jokes. Oh, it's sad. It's so sad. Yes, it's true because the, the, the drilling is continuing. Right. It's going on more than ever. And and how many more climate disasters do we need? I mean, these people are going to destroy the planet and they're going to destroy all of us. Somehow they've got to be stopped. And it's going to take a massive amount of uh, citizen uh, protests it's to have that people. happen. So I, I, I really wanted to make sure that you had your say. So thank you so kindly, Charlotte Dennett, author of Follow the Pipelines, for having been on politics done right. Thank you, Alberto. Hopefully we'll get to peace. <laughs> I agree. It's going to take people being aware, intelligent. Yeah. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you so much, Egbert. You're doing important work. We are honored once again to have Norman Solomon, who is a an American journalist, activist, media critic, and co-founder and national coordinator of RootsAction.org. He is the author of War Made Easy and is a longtime associate of FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. His book, War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine, is a must read. And you're back here again. First of all, welcome to Politics Done Right, Senor Solomon. How are you doing today? I'm hanging in here. Thanks a lot, Egberto. I'm so glad to be back with you. Well, you know, last week was, or not last week, a couple of days ago, it was 9-11. And before I ask you my first question, I want to tell you a short story. At KPFT 90.1, we had a caller that was irate that I didn't start the program with 9-11. And uh, I relayed that, you know, I am, that these people never asked to be sacrificial lambs at, on 9-11. And I expressed to them about the, the thousands of people that died with the invasion in Panama. Not, not to equate any of these people with that, but I wanted to show that there's a lot of harm that's been done by us. And, you know, of course, there's also Allende for 9-11 in Chile. So, I mean, um, what are your thoughts, first of all, on the celebration of 9-11? Those uh, anniversaries really you know, resonate powerfully and emotionally as they should. And history is precious because if we don't know the past, we really don't know where the present is coming from. And we don't know where we're going unless we can change course. And I'm glad you mentioned all three of those tragedies because that's what each one of them were. The invasion of Panama in 1989, just a made up pretext, uh, some Navy US uh, trooper got insulted and the first President Bush used it as an excuse to go in and slaughter people just because of a power trip to control around the canal and uh, Central America and so forth. We just marked 50 years of the 9-11 anniversary in Chile and it happened a coincidence September 11th, 1973, the US-backed coup deposed a not only democratically elected government, but the government headed by Salvador Allende, the popular unity that was about giving milk to starving children. It was about health care. It was about respecting and honoring and, and rewarding workers for their actual work rather than exploiting them. And after a few years of this tremendous grassroots organizing and achievements for human well being in Chile, the United States government went in and helped this horrific coup that ushered in 17 years of barbaric torture and repression under the Pinochet regime. And as I say, by coincidence, 22 years ago, the 9-11 tragedy that took 3,000 lives in one day, September 11th, 2001. And so we mark that, we mourn those people now as we did then. One of the things that I emphasize in this book you mentioned that's just come out, War Made Invisible, 
is that the preciousness of human life needs to be a single standard. And what we're constantly besieged by through the ideologues, the nationalists, the racists, the xenophobes, is to present to us the concept tacitly through omission or sometimes explicitly that some lives really matter and some don't. And so when we look at the so-called war on terror for the last 22 years, it's come into focus for me as I've talked with people about this, that we can even put it in numerical terms. Human beings are not numbers, and yet we can get a sense of the scale. 3,000 3, human souls extinguished on 9-11, each one of them innocent, each one of them civilians. For the next two decades, according to the Kosovo Project at Brown University, the U.S. led so-called war on terror in response, we were told, to 9-11, extinguished more than 400,000 civilian lives directly. So, you know, Egberto, I think about that. 3,000, more than 400,000, that means for every person killed on 9-11, equally innocent, more than 100 people were killed because of the U.S. wars. And I'd sort of sum this up in a sense by saying that what happened was displaced rage, grief, chauvinism, and collective punishment of the innocent. That is so true. It's amazing that you said that. Because when I, you know, I'm originally from Central America, Panama, in fact, and the the place that they leveled, they leveled three places, Chorrillo, uh, Colón, and David. These were the, the, the places where the Guardia was in these places. And, and uh, you know, they came on and said 516 people died. We all know it's these are tenements and it's thousands of people who, who died there. So I asked the, the, the caller who... I uh, thought many of us by bringing out these truths are being disrespectful. I asked the caller, I said, suppose the same vengeance that that uh, Bush displayed towards Iraq, which was the wrong protagonist anyway, suppose that uh, that one or two or three of those Panamanians aggrieved by the innocent loss of their entire families out there, suppose they decided that they wanted to exact vengeance again or vengeance on those that attack them. And that is a cycle that we speak about. And when you talk about forever wars, how do we get around it other than, well, let me not give an answer. How do we get around these forever wars based on these fallacies when so many Americans are convinced in statements like these people at 9-11 were martyrs. These were people who never asked to be martyrs. They never asked to be sacrificed, but everybody's talking about, we thank you for your sacrifice. They didn't ask for that. Right. We have cycles, as you said, that have been going on, and we could go back to the Greek tragedies of a few millennia ago that explored that human reality. We should be realistic, but not fatalistic. We can, and we really need to break those cycles of violence, and those cycles are fueled by this kind of nationalism, and of course, the profits from the military industrial complex, huge profit taking by major military contractors. I don't call them defense contractors. It might be uppercase D defense, but they are military contractors. Most of what is provided by Raytheon or Boeing or Northrop Grumman has nothing to do with defense. As a matter of fact, it actually makes us more endangered, militarizing the planet, further exporting more weaponry and so forth. So we have this opportunity to say, we're going to educate, we're going to agitate, we're going to organize, we're going to build independent media. And in our own small ways, my book, this program, we are part of this ecology of people from the grassroots growing and saying, we're not going to put up with this anymore. Now, as we talk about the military industrial complex, a question that that all, always bothers me, do you think do you think that uh, these guys promote, bribe our politicians to do all that they do with the programs that they for building all these equipment, some of them that will never be used? Do you think this is a, is a concerted effort just to make money irrespective of uh, the damage that it caused uh, to humanity? Do you think that these guys know the damage it caused, but 
that is just the the cost of doing business? There are true believers uh, in the United States as the de facto Pax Americana. Uh, we hear all the sloganeering, which I assume to some significant degree among many of those so-called leaders is really believed. Uh, American exceptionalism uh, under the Clinton administration ever since we've heard that the United States is the world's indispensable nation. And as I say in the book, the United States is indispensable to itself. Most of the rest of the world would do just fine, thank you, without the United States. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. um, quite a bit better in many respects. The U.S. is 4% of the world's population, and yet to hear about it, oh, we're, we're God's gift to the world. Many, most people in many respects experience it opposite. I'm afraid that not only the nationalism and zeal for geopolitical positioning and the trade agree agreements and leverage and power in different parts of the world, that's a lot of it and mixed in in there, just the tremendous profits. I mean, even Eisenhower in 1961, when he left the White House, called it a military industrial complex. Now it's a military industrial media surveillance complex, Silicon Valley making out like bandits, all these uh, corporatists who were just at the top strata, they're getting really rich where we're getting immiserated. Uh, the population, I mean, whether you live in San Francisco, Houston, New York, or anywhere else in the U.S., you don't have to walk far to find people in communities lacking health care, education, housing, infant care, elderly care. And so I often think of something that Martin Luther King Jr. said when he denounced what he called the madness of militarism. He said this excessive, extreme military spending, he called it a demonic suction tube. That is sad. Now, let me tell you, um, Norman, um, what I find ironic is that you made some statements about America just now. Some of the world would do just fine without America. Uh, we are we shouldn't sit down there and call ourselves exceptional. I consider you a patriot. I consider you a patriot. I consider anybody who looks at the flaws inherent to our system and decide I'm gonna speak out about it to see if we can change, if we can atone. That's a patriot. That's somebody who loves the country that they're in. How do we convey to those who are made to believe that people like you who tell the ultimate truth that you are in fact patriots and the ones who are telling them otherwise are the ones who should be considered traitors to the country. After all, if we follow their path, we're following our own demise. I think the word you used, atone, is very significant because without atoning, without remorse, then the arrogance will continue. President Biden just visited Vietnam. There was no indication of remorse. Um, in my book, I wrote about a quote that I stumbled across in the research from Jimmy Carter. And yes, he's the best ex-president we've had in our lifetimes, low bar, but still he's done a lot of stuff after being president. But when he was president, I just think of, let's have real history. Let's understand what happened. The chaos now in El Salvador, you can go back to President Jimmy Carter's support for the Duarte regime which was a suppressive one in the late 1970s. I bring that up in the context of Vietnam because Jimmy Carter, two months after he became president, was asked at a news conference, Mr. President, uh, do you feel that the United States should provide some restitution and aid to Vietnam now that the war is over? And President Carter replied, quote, the destruction was mutual, unquote. And oh, he added, I never knew that. He said, for that reason, we have no reason to feel bad about the war. We don't owe them anything. And here we are in the latter part now of 2023. And I think about just in the last couple of decades, Libya, 
Afghanistan, Iraq, where the United States used tremendous firepower. We don't owe them anything. As a matter of fact, I, I wrote about in War Made Invisible, this is another form of the invisibility, very little talked about, that the United States government has basically stole several billion dollars from the Afghan people. After the war was over, just retained several billion dollars that the Central Bank of Afghanistan deserved and needed desperately. And as a result, the last couple of winters, major famine and significant starvation and huge malnutrition. So it's not enough that the United States for 20 years occupies and bombs and strafes Afghanistan. Now we're not even assisting them in the Go human ahead. being's dire need. Let me let me stop you there for a second because uh, making that statement, I want folks to be able to corroborate it because you, I, you just taught me something. You said that there's a there are billions of dollars that Afghanistan has, I guess, throughout the Western banking system that it's due them that they never receive. Is that from rare earths and so forth that's been mined from their land or where did that money come from? The uh, Karzai government had it um, essentially deposited with the US government. And so it belonged to the government of Afghanistan. When the Karzai uh, regime fell, government, whatever you want to call it, and the Taliban came back, the US uh, was asked and pleaded with by Bernie Sanders and others in Congress, members of the Progressive Caucus, please, the winter is coming. People need the money. They need the financial heft that the Central Bank of Afghanistan uh, possessing uh, to be able to do the development and the aid and literally put food in people's mouths. And uh, Biden dithered and dithered for several months and then about four months after withdrawal from Afghanistan, he came up with this cockamamie formula. He said out of the $7 billion that the United States possessed of Afghan government money, half of it would be put in a trust fund for victims of 9-11 in the United States. Well, Afghanistan what? had nothing to do with uh, what happened on 9-11. Not one of those people Wow. was uh, Afghan of the 19 hijackers. That's how crazy it got. And then the other half was eventually supposed to wend its way back towards Afghanistan, but it's unclear if and how that's happened. You know, um, I, I try to explain several times, you know, because you'd hear people say that uh, those terrorists who attack us, they hate our freedom. And it's it's so that is so far removed from what's on their minds. You don't hate somebody's freedoms. You hate somebody who messes with you or somebody who puts you in bondage. And I think that's exactly what you're illustrating there. I mean, uh, no, nobody hates America's freedom. In fact, I read sometimes I wonder how free we are. Wonder, you know, Mark Twain said long ago, uh, the, in the United States, we have the, uh, the tremendous blessings uh, for freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, and the wisdom to never use either one. Um, he was exaggerating a bit in Mark Twain fashion, but uh, an underutilized First Amendment, an underutilized freedom, our struggles really are all about using it, using those freedoms rather than just sort of being acculturated to be passive. And at this point, I think we have that opportunity to turn things around, but it means cutting against the dominant culture. So let, let me ask you, um, Norman, if, if you had the power, in, and, and let's do this in closing, if you have, and, and, and take as much time as you want, in closing, what would be, now, first of all, I know, in closing, please, folks, get that book, uh, War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll, This Military Machine. I think it's an important read. But above and beyond that, if you had, omnipotent power. How could we turn this juggernaut around? We could turn it around potentially with what Antonio Gramsci, the anti-fascist, called pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will, to realize that in terms of the climate emergency, in terms of the militarism, the threat of nuclear war, uh, rampant 
corporate capitalism running amok, all these different uh, challenges and evils, that we have an opportunity to be realistic but not fatalistic. We can energize our independent media outlets. We can organize in communities and around the country. We can build the kind of independent communication systems that are against our culture. I mean, when you think about it, the mass media only really urge us consistently to go out and buy things and maybe vote once in a while. That's antithetical to what democracy needs to be. Part of what really struck me in researching ways that we've been scammed and we've been spun into ignorance and through omission, uh, absence of knowledge of our own history, is that democracy is supposed to be the informed consent of the governed. It doesn't work otherwise. But for the most part, now we have the uninformed consent, pseudo consent of the governed or really dominated by corporate military powers. I think we do have the potential to have a political and social culture where magic wand or not, if I could at least help this to happen, we'd have a much more politicized culture. We would have a, a, a sort of a horizontal way of people communicating and nurturing each other. We wouldn't say how much is he worth, meaning dollars in the bank or investment in Wall Street. We would say, how much is she worth? How much is he worth as a human being helping others, people that we don't know, being willing to help people we don't know because of the common good. And so the possibility, I think, and I'd sort of sum it up this way, the possibility is to educate, agitate, organize, and struggle for political power. One more comment that Martin Luther King made that is just to me tremendously powerful. He said that power without love is cruel. It can be very brutal. He said, love without power is anemic and sentimental. So we need love and power put together. Norman Solomon, American journalist, activist, media critic, the founder of RootsAction.org and the author of War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine. Thank you so kindly for having been in on Politics Done Right with your wise words as usual. Thanks so much. And I really appreciate everything you're doing, Egberto. And many thanks ongoing to Politics Done Right. Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that, unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right.